Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we feature New Zealand anti-nuclear and climate activist Kevin Hester for an in-depth analysis of what his no-nukes country is doing, inviting a nuclear-powered U.S. naval vessel into its waters next year, an absolute legal no-no since 1987. We also hear from Mimi Gurman of No Nukes Northwest and Radcast.org on how the peace sailboat she and Harvey Wasserman of Solartopia were on, the Golden Rule, was rammed by a Washington State police boat during a peaceful protest of warships. And Byron DeLear checks in with a blistering perspective on the release of a long-suppressed report by the Environmental Protection Agency on the Westlake landfill that proves that the moms the Coldwater Creek activists, and all those others who were protesting were right. Plus, our ever-cheeky numbnuts of the week, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than can be found in the million-plus uncounted California election ballots. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June twenty-first, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Our top story, which broke today, is that California's last nuclear power plant, Diablo Canyon, will be phased out by 2025 under a joint proposal announced Tuesday morning, this morning, June 21st, by Pacific Gas and Electric Company and Labor and Environmental Groups. Under the proposal, the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in San Luis Obispo County would be retired by PG&E after its current Nuclear Regulatory Commission operating licenses expire in November 2024 and August 2025. Damon Moglen, senior advisor with Friends of the Earth, a group that was formed to oppose Diablo, said this was a 20th century mistake and we've got a 21st century solution. We're not only going to close this plant, but we're going to do it with greenhouse gas-free energy. But Daniel Hirsch, director of the Program on Environmental and Nuclear Policy at UC Santa Cruz, tempered his approval with caution. He said, Diablo really does pose a clear and present danger. If we had an earthquake larger than the plant was designed for, you could have a Fukushima-type event that could devastate a large part of California. He concluded, we have to get lucky for the next eight years, but the risks are massively reduced by not having to face that risk thereafter. In New York on Thursday, June 16, Friends of the Earth and other environmental organizations, including Beyond Nuclear and NEARS, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, filed an emergency petition with the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit asking that the court compel the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to prevent Entergy from restarting New York's aging Indian Point nuclear reactor, which was found to have unprecedented parts failures in its critical core cooling system. The degradation and or disappearance of more than one in three critical bolts in the Indian Point Unit 2 nuclear reactor cooling system was revealed during a fueling outage in March. Despite the unprecedented failure of critical bolts, damage greater than that seen in any reactor before in either the U.S. or around the globe, Entergy, the operating company, immediately announced plans to restart the reactor in June after simply replacing the bolts. Damon Moglen of Friends of the Earth, who seems to be bi-coastal this week, said, This is a matter of common sense denied. If a machine breaks, you have to figure out what is wrong and fix it. Instead, at Indian Point, Entergy has decided that the priority is to get the damaged reactor up and running by summer to protect their profits, and the NRC is acting like a lapdog and not a watchdog, assuring that the reactors are safe to operate. Big news in St. Louis. According to an internal Environmental Protection Agency report that has been suppressed for three years, 
removing the hottest radioactive waste within the Westlake landfill is feasible and could reduce long-term risks from the Bridgeton area landfill. This report, released by the agency in what they have characterized as a voluntary move, bolsters the arguments of environmentalists in the area who have long advocated for removing the radioactive waste rather than simply capping the unlined landfill. For a perspective on this report and its release, Nuclear Hot Seat spoke with Byron DeLear. Byron is a candidate for the Missouri State Legislator who has been a regular source on this story. Byron DeLear, there has just been the revelation of a report from the Environmental Protection Agency that has been withheld for three years. Tell us about this report, which has just been made public. What is it, and what does it say? This report is a summary of the National Remedy Review Board, which is a peer review group that oversees Superfund site cleanup plans. As many of your listeners know, the Westlake Landfill is a Superfund site. It has tens of thousands of tons of radioactive material that is sourced from the Manhattan Project. And this material is essentially sitting in an unlined municipal landfill in an uncontained fashion. It poses what the report calls a principal threat to the community. And what is uh, shocking about this report, not only has the EPA suppressed its release for more than three years, and there have been FOIA requests, there have been requests from journalists, There have been requests from uh, advocacy organizations to see this report, and those requests have all been denied. Not only have they suppressed it, but the contents of this report essentially confirm everything that the activist community has been asserting about how dangerous the presence of this material in the heart of St. Louis County, a county of a million people, is. And it's an ongoing threat, and it needs to be removed. Other issues that are exposed in this report are almost a grossly negligent operation by the EPA in terms of their desire to just put a cap over the site and almost run afoul of any kind of logical approach towards handling this material or remediating these dangerous substances. The cap was recommended as of 2008, was it not? The EPA had a record of decision in 2008 to put a cap over the site, which clearly would not contend with any of the groundwater contamination. But further, there's a number of different issues about having a cap that really is not tenable. I think the most uh, shocking thing about this report is its absolute one-sidedness in regard to how the EPA was trying to make the argument to defend this record of decision, to put a cap on it. And the review board, which is kind of an oversight entity, comments on several of the arguments that the EPA made in trying to ram the cap solution through and employs basic logic principles of reductio ad absurdum, basically reducing the EPA's arguments to absurdity. For example, the EPA cites the Uranium Mill Tailings Act and says that some of the material that is migrated off-site, that it should be collected because of the Uranium Mill and Tailings Act. And then the board comments on that and says, well, if the Uranium Mill Tailings Act applies to this material that's moved off-site by 20 feet, what about the material that's on-site? Doesn't that apply to the Uranium Mill Tailings Act as well? Shouldn't that be removed? And so it's posing all these really obvious questions that essentially takes the EPA's thesis and just rips it to shreds. And the reason why they've suppressed it clearly is because this is a highly embarrassing and highly damning report, and it runs contrary to all the positions that they've been taking for years and the the way they've been representing this site to the community, that it poses no health threat, that we cannot remove the material, that it would be a, a massive threat to environmental justice issues and so on and so forth if we remove the material. And again, the board comments on that argument. The board says, Well, you cite that there may be environmental justice issues if this material is removed, and yet in your long-term projection, if the material is left there, you don't cite any environmental justice issues. 
So it just kind of makes the whole Region 7 of the EPA, their handling of this site, it just renders it as being grossly negligent and perhaps even forwarding an agenda that would have the EPA basically do the least amount of work necessary to protect this community. And in many experts' opinions, independent experts, the experts from the Attorney General's office, Bob Alvarez, Lucas Kaltafen, folks that have been studying this site, Helen Caldecott, Lois Gibbs, there is no way that a half-measured solution in dealing with this highly radiotoxic material could be considered a way to protect the long-term interests and health of this community. Two questions arise from this. First of all, what is the course of action that is now going to be empowered, or how is it going to be empowered to get this cleanup put into action? The Just Moms group have called for a congressional investigation into the mishandling of the information and essentially the adversarial relationship between an entity known as the Environmental Protection Agency whose mission is to protect the health and environment of the community, and yet they're treating this community in an adversarial context. And, Libby, you know full well in many ways this echoes the exact handling of the Flint, Michigan situation with lead poisoning of the water. And these agencies need to be put in check. And it's up to the congressional delegation, it's up to the inspector generals of these agencies to put these agencies back on their mission of protecting the community. Why is it that the people need to assert the facts and data of this case over and over and be laughed at and be told that they're lying, and yet in the end we have proven that the facts that we've been asserting have all been the case? Why is that? That is not right. That is not how the government is supposed to operate. We have a companion bill to the Senate bill that passed in February, which transfers jurisdiction of the Westlake Superfund site to the Army Corps of Engineers. There's a companion bill that's sort of in hiatus. It's in an impasse right now in the U.S. House, and that's called House Resolution 4100. And we've been calling different representatives and trying to get the Missouri delegation to get this bill passed in the U.S. House so that the Army Corps of Engineers, which has the capacity to execute the cleanup, they have the expertise, they've been at the beginning of the nuclear project of the United States since its inception. I mean, I've mentioned this on one of your other programs, Libby. The Manhattan Project, the original name of it was the Manhattan Engineering District. So the Army Corps of Engineers have been at the front of this. And that's another thing that this document, the National Remedy Review Board document, exposes, is just the absolute inability for the EPA to even metabolize the notion of cleaning up radioactive materials from the nuclear weapons program. I mean, the reason why this internal argument is going back and forth and they're like pointing fingers at each other, and in one section of the report, it's refuting one of the EPA's Region 7's positions that the material can't be removed. And it says, well, actually, you could use on-site testing equipment to determine which material is radioactive and set it aside and then safely remove it. And it's kind of like, you know, almost talking to the Region 7 like they're kindergartners or something, trying to handhold them in this process. It's really, really embarrassing. And I can see why they would want this report suppressed. But it just really goes to show that the agency is unable and does not have the capacity to deal with nuclear waste. In fact, Bob Alvarez mentioned the other day to me on the phone that he doesn't think that the EPA has removed any radioactive materials from any landfill or any buried sites ever. So this is why the Army Corps of Engineers needs to be brought into this situation. And for the other 100 contaminated sites in the region – the Army Corps of Engineers has successfully removed 1,200,000 tons of material put in specially constructed rail cars and shipped off to a licensed disposal facility in Idaho, which I understand is not a long-term solution in terms of us dealing with the nuclear monster, so to speak. But getting it away from sources of drinking water, getting it away from population centers is a step in the right direction, to be sure. Byron DeLear. So what the North St. Louis community has been saying for years is all true. The EPA hasn't fully characterized the site. The material is a principal threat, 
And the EPA has had an agenda to push through a solution that doesn't take into consideration long-term health threats, meaning it's not a solution to be continued. In Illinois, Exelon is shuttering the Clinton nuclear reactor in 2017 and Quad Cities in 2018. But that's when the real problems start, because the company is hundreds of millions of dollars short of the cash needed to safely store the highly radioactive waste at its Clinton and Quad Cities facilities and restore the sites to productive use. The company is solely responsible for the cost of cleaning up the land so it can be put to other uses. Oh, don't hold your breath. But under federal rules, nuclear operators must set aside money for eventual reclamation, Each plant has its own fund, and Exelon is clearly underfunded. And now it's time for the duck (coughs) and cover report. At Fort Calhoun in Nebraska on May 10th, the containment cooling water system was proven to be inoperable due to an unanalyzed condition. This condition could have led to the inability of the component cooling water system to perform its design function of providing a cooling medium for the containment atmosphere under a loss of coolant accident. In other words, it wouldn't have done its job. And during a review of this notification, it was discovered that this exact same unanalyzed condition also occurred five other times in the last three years. Good thing they're shutting this one down by the end of the year. (coughs) At Salem in New Jersey on April 17, which was just reported on June 15, an input test light was not lit as expected. While attempting to replace the light bulb, the emergency diesel generator unexpectedly automatically started. The problem was blamed on switch degradation. A slight pressure applied to the switch was enough to allow the block signal to be momentarily interrupted, even without repositioning the switch. The loss of the block was most likely due to the operator's finger coming in contact with the switch during the bulb replacement. So how many nuclear engineers does it take to screw in a light bulb? This is what deterioration of nuclear reactors looks like. At davis Bessey in Ohio on June 16, an issue was identified for the potential impact of low barometric pressure associated with a tornado on the emergency diesel generators. There are a whole series of steps that the NRC identified that sound like why the horseshoe nail took down the entire kingdom, but the bottom line is that A tornado's low barometric pressure can take out the emergency diesel generators that power the cooling system in an emergency, such as a tornado. (coughs) This final NRC notification for the week could have been in duck and cover, but truly it is... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. With all of the many safety concerns at Diablo Canyon, the earthquake faults, superheated water released by once through cooling, spent fuel rods stuck in water pools and tin can canisters, the thin canisters that are stored in a saltwater environment that can erode them, and all the problems that come with an aging rust bucket of a nuclear reactor. What is on this week's Nuclear Regulatory Commission report? T. Unopened herbal tea identified in the protected area. Oh, the humanity! An employee self-reported possession of an unopened herbal tea containing naturally occurring alcohol in the protected area. The drink was removed from the protected area. Oh, but wait, there's more. Because it was reported in an update that while investigating this incident, it was determined that cooking wine used in the cafeteria should be removed from the protected area, with no word if that dangerous exercise has yet been undertaken. With dangers like this, It's a good thing that Diablo Canyon is being shut down in eight or nine years. We should be so lucky to get through it with no more tea infiltrating their safety perimeters. 
And that is why Nuclear Regulatory Commission, nitpickers that you are in all the wrong areas, you once more are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Vermont is now fond of calling itself nuclear free, but in truth, that ain't the case. The Vermont Public Service Board last week gave Entergy the go-ahead to start building its second nuclear waste storage pad at the shut-down Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant, touting it as having, quote, minimal aesthetic impact. We're not worried about the aesthetics, we're worried about the radiation. According to activist Pam Hawley, commenting on Facebook, they will never be nuclear-free at Yankee. Millions upon millions will be spent to monitor the time bomb waste that will never stop being deadly. And this cost will be passed on, as usual, to the consumer. Most of the public has no clue the factors involved for these shutdowns, and if told at the beginning of this nuclear age, may have been against their proliferation. And in Nebraska, a big win for the Pine Ridge Reservation. The Oglala Sioux Tribe and activists scored a win on May 26 when federal administrative judges ruled that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff has failed to take a hard look at cultural resources in recommending renewal of a uranium mining license for Crow Butte Mine. The decision delays permitting. May it become a permanent delay. Over to Japan, where if you spin it, you win it. Pay attention to the languaging. A third-party investigation promised by Nagita Prefecture concluded that TEPCO's president instructed company officials to not mention the word meltdown after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began. Others from TEPCO tried to claim that the prime minister's office requested that they not use the word. But former Prime Minister Naoto Kan has repeatedly stated that he did not know of the meltdown status at Fukushima until two months after the disaster began. On Friday, June 17, a Japanese court upheld an order to keep two reactors at the Takahama nuclear plant closed. The court decision, upholding a petition from residents living near the facility who are concerned about safety, keeps the legal battle center stage in a struggle by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby's government to restore atomic power by ignoring all consequences five years after the Fukushima disaster began. On March 9, a district court ordered Kansai Electric, Japan's second biggest utility, to shut down the reactors at Fukui Prefecture west of Tokyo in the country's first injunction to halt an operating nuclear facility. Friday's decision denied the utility's attempt to temporarily halt the shutdown order. Highly radioactive soil has turned up at a Fukushima high school, soil that should by law be removed by the central government, but had been left dumped in the corner of a schoolyard because the construction of a local storage site for waste had been stalled. Students at the school were not given an official warning that the radioactive soil was potentially hazardous to their health, Two nonprofit monitoring entities tested soil scooped up by one of the teachers, and the result showed between 27,000 and 33,000 becquerels of radioactive cesium per kilogram. The law states that the central government is responsible for disposing of waste measuring more than 8,000 becquerels per kilogram. And the principal of Fukushima North High School said the school does not plan to take extra safety measures with regard to the storage of the polluted dirt, saying the waste is not believed to be outright dangerous. Is there an in-wrong danger? The soil had been left for several years in an area near the parking lot for bicycles used by the students. According to the Utsumo Maya City Government, a bamboo shoot contained in the school lunch of May 10, 2016, contained two times the already too high allowable cesium-134 and 130 safety levels. 234 becquerels per kilogram, when the allowable limit is 100 becquerels per kilogram. The food was eaten by 560 students and teachers at an elementary school by the time they obtained the analysis results. 
According to the French Embassy in Japan, a Fukushima food dinner party was held on June 17. In attendance were Fukushima's governor, the Minister for Reconstruction, and French singer Charles Aznavour. On the menu were Fukushima beef, cherries, and locally raised chicken, which were all served as French cuisine. They cooked so fast, and all by themselves. Speaking of France, French authorities have been forced to close the Fessenheim nuclear facility over fears that the nuclear reactor may be using possibly faulty parts from Arriva. And the Dutch Safety Board announced on Wednesday, June 15, that it is launching an investigation into how the Netherlands works with its neighbors to prevent and handle any cross border nuclear power accidents. The probe will focus on three aging nuclear power stations on the Dutch Belgian border Borsel in the Netherlands, Duel, and Tehange in Belgium. The Tehange II nuclear reactor was automatically shut down on Friday, June 10, following a motor failure in a non nuclear part of the plant. And in Ukraine, a long awaited milestone has been reached. As of June 6th, the last damaged used fuel assembly from units 1 to 3 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was finally removed. It only took 30 years. And of course, it's still radioactive. And of course, the sarcophagus, the new sarcophagus, which is supposed to encase the old sarcophagus, which is crumbling around Chernobyl, is still not finished. As in all things nuclear, to be continued just about forever. We'll have today's featured interviews in just a moment, but first, I want to thank all of you who celebrated Nuclear Hot Seat's fifth anniversary last week by sending in a donation. Your generosity will now allow me to book my flight to Excellence in Journalism this September. The conference where I will have a crack at over 1,000 mainstream media, journalists, news directors, assignment editors, and all the rest. I'm confident that, with your help, the other expenses will be covered, and I will be there in full on activist media mode. I have a deep appreciation for all of you who have chosen to help support my work and the show. It touches me deeply. Whether it's a one time Starbucks gift, the amount you'd normally pay for a cup of coffee plus tip, a monthly recurring donation, or a one shot that's something larger. Everything counts towards covering the show's expenses and getting me to the stories where I can do a great deal of good. Also, your kind words help keep me in good heart. So as we move into year six, believe it or not, year six of Nuclear Hot Seat. Please help keep Nuclear Hot Seat going as the source you can depend upon for verifiable news, slam bang interviews, and a whole bunch of anti nuclear attitude. To donate now, go to nuclearhotseat.com, click on the big red donate button, and whatever you can do to help, know that it is deeply appreciated, and I am truly grateful. There are two more interviews for you, and they connected to each other in fascinating, unpredictable ways. Last week, Mimi Gurman of No Nukes Northwest and Radcast.org reported having been on a peace vessel on the Willamette River in Oregon, peacefully protesting warships sailing to Portland, many of them nuclear powered, when, well, I'll let Mimi tell you about it in her own words. I was with the team of the Golden Rule sailboat, which had come up from California to start a 17 stop tour throughout the Pacific Northwest, bringing attention to no nukes, to our nuclear power plant, Hanford, and all things nuclear. On the 9th, we had gone out at 1 o'clock on the boat on the Willamette River, which was during Fleet Week in Portland, where all of these warships from all over come in town and they dock. And it's a big thing here where kids are supposed to come down and really enjoy themselves on these warships, learn all about war, and maybe you too can join up when you're 18 and take part. 
So I was excited to go out on the Golden Rule to protest the warships being in my city on the river that I enjoy. We went out at 1 o'clock, and we had established communication with different police river patrol, including the Coast Guard, and everything was fine. They would tell us when we could move, when we couldn't, where we could go, et cetera. And at 5 o'clock, while we were waiting to come back to dock, we were waiting for a destroyer to dock so that we could get under the steel bridge. The Washington County police boat turned on its engines. We were watching this from the deck of the boat. They turned on their engines, revved the engines, and came directly at us. Within about 30 seconds, they had hit our boat. Did you see this as an intentional action on their part? This was absolutely intentional. There was no communication from them. There were no lights on their boat. We had had communication with the other boats. We were exactly where we were supposed to be. All of the other police boats had left us alone because we were where we were supposed to be. There was nowhere else to get to. They just decided that they were going to ram us, and that's what they did. And Harvey Wasserman was standing with me. We were talking strategies at the time to shut down the Columbia Generating Nuclear Power Plant. And we watched this happen. We watched them turn their boat on, and within seconds, our boat was hit. This was an aggressive act. I have no idea what exactly their intention was. All I know is what I saw I can't, for the life of me, find any other reason than an act of aggression to do this. What the Washington County Police ended up saying was that they had communicated with us, that we wouldn't respond to them, that they had turned their lights on, that they had turned their siren on, and that we were moving into the center lane in the Willamette, which we weren't. None of what they said in response was true. In the wake of this accident, was anyone physically hurt? And what was the level of damage to the boat? The damage to the boat was a gouge on the starboard side, which was right underneath my feet and Harvey's feet. Right where we stood uh, is a hole, and I don't know yet how much damage there is. The Golden Roll hasn't had it checked. It's saleable. So they're going to continue to sail. Uh, They'll know more, I think, when they take it back to California when this particular trip of 17 stops is done. So fortunately, it was above the water level. No one on the boat was injured. It was very scary. What kind of follow-up are you planning to this? Is there an investigation? Is there any kind of legal action that is being contemplated or that has been instigated at this point? I can't speak at all for what the Golden Rule is choosing to do. What I am doing as co-founder of No Nukes Northwest and being present on the boat witnessing what happened, I'm creating a lawsuit against the Washington County Sheriff's Department. And that's underway right now. We're putting things together for that. We have to stop allowing the police to harass and intimidate environmental protesters from doing any action, whether it's in the river or in the ocean or on our street. It has to stop. We have a right to protest. We have a right to say to the city of Portland that we do not want these warships here in our river, and we have a right to protest. One of the things that I'm doing as a follow-up with No Nukes Northwest is creating an entire campaign, which has already begun, to stop the warships from coming in to Portland. And it's time that we stop glorifying war and glorifying all of the mechanisms of war, these warships, that we stop glorifying nuclear energy, calling it clean and inexpensive and the thing that we need to hold on to while we pull off of fossil fuels. We don't need nukes. They're not clean. They kill people. And so do these warships. So together with a few other people, we are mounting a campaign. Harvey Wasserman is helping me out with that as well. And we may very well have Greenpeace involved with this to stop these warships from coming in from all future years, starting in 2017. That was Mimi German of No Nukes Northwest and Radcast.org. A second activist on the opposite side of the world has long used some of the exact same tactics that Mimi spoke about to terrific and lasting effect. Kevin Hester was born in New Zealand and became involved in the early 1980s in that country's environmental movement, which was heavily influenced by anti-nuclear activities that resulted in having New Zealand declared a nuclear-free country in 1987. 
Kevin was once arrested with Peter Wilcox, the skipper of the Greenpeace Rainbow Warrior, and charged with obstructing a nuclear ship in the course of its passage, something of which he is very proud. In recent years, most of Kevin's waking hours are spent either enjoying the ocean and natural habitat as he watches the biosphere unraveling from within, or researching online as he endeavors to warn us all about the imminent dangers of climate change. Kevin Hester, so good to have you back on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be back here with you again. Let's talk about the New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone Disarmament and Arms Control Act that was passed on June 8th of 1987. It's New Zealand law that established the country as a nuclear-free and biological weapons-free zone. How did that come into being? There was a groundswell of movement around New Zealand about the atmospheric testing that the French were carrying out in the Central Pacific. And environmentalists in New Zealand and you know globally were all aware of it. And because it was in our neighbourhood, New Zealand for whatever reason, took up the cudgels and fought our government and brought the government to the table. I don't believe that in the beginning David Longy was actually anti-nuclear, but what he was was a populist and he did see the groundswell of resistance against it and we managed to get it passed. And David Longy, for those of us not familiar with New Zealand history, is or was? He was the New Zealand Prime Minister at the time when the Act was passed. What did it mean when the act was passed? Tell us what it consisted of and the kind of impact that it had in New Zealand. Well, it instantly terminated the military relationship between New Zealand and the United States and the ANZUS Treaty, Australia, New Zealand and the United States Treaty. So we were drop kicked out the gate immediately because at the time, the American government refused to confirm or deny that there were nuclear weapons on a vessel. And as a result, military vessels were no longer going to be able to come into New Zealand because the US government wasn't prepared to concede or deny. What, if anything, was the impact of this law, this nuclear-free law, on New Zealand culture, society, economics, or were you guys just fine without it? For most of us, it was an absolute breakthrough and a victory. As environmentalists, we have very few victories. Normally what we do is slow down the erosion. You know, we make it at least bad all the time. But this was a definitive victory. And the French were forced to stop atmospheric testing, and then they only did testing below the surface, which was, you know, equally destructive but less obvious to the human eye. So it was a huge victory for us in a whole lot of ways where it motivated both New Zealanders and environmentalists and anti-nuclear activists, especially around the world, to see, okay, it can be done. We can have a win. This has been the policy for almost 30 years now, except just last week, the New Zealand Navy issued an invitation to the United States to join in your country's Navy's 75th birthday celebrations next year. Why might this potentially end the 30-year freeze on military ships visiting New Zealand? Well, it will definitely end it. But as has been said by Russell Norman, who's the uh, head of Greenpeace in New Zealand, and also uh, Nikki Hager, which is New Zealand's leading investigative journalist, is that they said as it proves that our legislation was and continues to be a victory because the only person who's made a concession here is the United States. The United States are going to come back and they're going to say there are no nuclear weapons on these vessels. For the first time in many years, Nikki and I are not on the same wavelength on this because the legislation is old and it predates the time of depleted uranium weapons. So what the Act does is it covers nuclear weapons And by definition, they mean thermonuclear devices. But I believe that there's probably not a U.S. military vessel sailing this planet that doesn't have depleted uranium munitions on it, because that's what has become the weapon of choice in in recent years. You know, a classic example is to see the catastrophic consequences of the 
carpet bombing of Fallujah in Iraq and the absolutely heartbreaking genetic damage that has been done to the people of Iraq through the use of depleted uranium. And I must say as well, not just to the people of Iraq, but also to the US soldiers that served and had anything to do with those weapons or even transporting them have all suffered an enormous amount of health issues. So I believe that when we see these vessels coming back to New Zealand, they won't be breaking the overall legislation as it is written, but they will be breaking the spirit of that legislation by bringing those depleted uranium munitions into New Zealand, or even just the contaminated vessels that they've traveled on previously. When you talk about America's nuclear fleet, does that in any way relate to the fact that so many of our ships in the Navy are powered by nuclear reactors? Oh, absolutely. There's no chance of a nuclear-powered vessel coming to New Zealand. That is completely outside of the gambit of the legislation. So I think that the battle that we will have is that we need to be able to prove somehow or other that there isn't nuclear weapons on those ships. What might be the consequences, the political impact of a U.S. Navy ship that may be carrying nuclear weapons showing up in New Zealand waters next year? They won't officially come here with nuclear weapons. That's a given. They will say that they aren't on there. But myself and a lot of anti-imperialist environmentalists on this planet won't believe for a second what the U.S. military is telling us. They will do whatever they want to do. So what will happen, irrespective of whatever declaration gets made, is that we will go back to what I was doing 30 years ago. I can't believe I'm doing this 30 years later. Is we will be blockading the harbour against the entry of those ships, irrespective of what they say is on them. Because what we know is that anyone with eyes wide open can see that the U.S. is stalking Russia, and to a degree China at the moment. And the possibility of having a, a nuclear weapons or a nuclear war or any kind of confrontation with Russia gets higher and higher every day. Bringing those ships back to New Zealand reintegrates us into the greater U.S. war machine. That hasn't been happening now for 32 years. We haven't had them here. Some people would say that makes us a bigger target, and I do believe that is true to some extent. But we're a member of the Five Eyes spy network, which is Canada, Britain, New Zealand, Australia, the United States. They have spy bases all around the world that are all integrated into the American and the NATO war machine. We have one in in New Zealand called the Waihopai spy base. We've a lot of us have had protests down there and because we know that that makes us a nuclear target because in the event of a shooting war breaking out between the United States and Russia, all of those spy networks will be taken out with whatever weapons they choose to use, whether it's nuclear or electromagnetic, whatever it is. So that war will come to New Zealand irrespective. But bringing US warships here, I believe, is the thin end of the wedge. It's the beginning of the erosion of what we've achieved in the 32 years. So we'll be campaigning against it irrespective of what the Americans tell us uh, are on board those ships. So, Kevin, what are you, what are we going to do about it? Well, I can very confidently say that the New Zealand people are never, ever going to allow the nuclear connection to be remade between the United States and New Zealand. A large number of people will blockade the harbours like we did 30 years ago and we will vociferously protest the the arrival of these ships coming back here. And what that will do is it will make it harder and harder for subsequent governments to attack our nuclear policy that we passed in 1987. But the trouble is, is that the government we have now is more and more sycophantic towards the United States than any that we've had for many decades So it's a matter of activists in New Zealand standing up and being counted yet again. Do you expect that the activist community that already exists will attract others to it and increase to numbers where you will be able to make that stand and make it stick? 
I'm not confident of that. And one of the reasons I would say is that New Zealand, you know, we have a lot of ecological and, and environmental and economic problems, but a lot of the young people have been bought off and they've been bought off with technology. And we don't have, to the same degree, the activist community that we had in the 60s and 70s, and that very much worries me. I'm really worried. So, you know, one of my roles has always been and will continue to be is to try and motivate young people to defend their position and to have the belief system to, to stop this. But I'm not confident. I'm not confident at all. What can those of us who do not live in New Zealand but are listening to this show, what can we do to support you and assist you in this work? Well, one thing to do would be to remember how significant, important and inspiring us getting that legislation passed 30 years ago and to use that as an example of what we can achieve. Look, you know, I think we're facing the greatest threat to humanity that's ever existed at the moment as a result of getting closer and closer to a nuclear war and the unravelling of our biosphere from abrupt climate change. But even though I believe that, I still am going to fight till the last breath. There is no way that I will take this lying down. I suspect that you will be talking to me at a prison cell before a hell of a lot longer. From my prison cell to your prison cell. Absolutely. But that's just the way things are. You know, the reality is, is that I have this charmed existence. I live in a beautiful country, a beautiful ecology. We haven't had war on our land since we stole the country from the indigenous people. So we've been lucky. There's wars raging all around the world. For me to have to stand up and fight and go to jail at this stage is a very small price to pay compared to what my comrades in Syria are suffering, what the people in Yemen are suffering, what the people in Gaza, I could name a hundred places. They are all suffering as a result of this imperialism. So for me to have to go to jail again, well, I'll do it. Kevin, it is always inspiring and exciting and a straight shot of clarity when we talk to you. And I know that we will be talking again. For now, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. From Nuclear Free New Zealand and a New Zealander that is not in jail, I'm being very happy to be on the show again. And as long as I can walk the streets a free man, I would always be happy to do it again for you. I'll take you up on that. As often happens, after we signed off from the official interview, Kevin and I kept talking. And that's when he shared with me this serendipitous tidbit. You know how the lyric at the start of Nuclear Hot Seat says, the activists are linking? Here's one tidy example of just that. So what we will do is we'll try and get as many people out on the blockade with as many Geiger counters as possible. Fortunately for me, Mimi Gurman organized the Missouri 9000 Geiger counter for me. And I'll make this official because the New Zealand GCSB will be listening to this interview. I won't be having it. Someone else will be using it and they can come and arrest me and they won't find the Geiger counter. That we will have plenty of them out on the boats and we'll prove whether or not there is any kind of nuclear component on those ships. But I will be very surprised if you didn't run a Geiger counter over an American warship and not get a hit. There was much more, but we'll save that for another time. New Zealand climate change and anti-nuclear activist Kevin Hester. I love his spirit. Activist shout out. Here is a great, easy activist action that any of you can take. It comes by way of Tom Prettyman, an avid nuclear hot seat listener in Nebraska. He wrote, I sent an email to the governor of Nebraska the other day asking if Nebraska had an emergency plan in place if there was an accident at either Fort Calhoun or Cooper nuclear power plants. Got a great email from the governor's office and an email from the director of Nebraska's emergency management agency. She sent me a 40-page PDF on what her agency is providing to the public in case of a nuclear emergency. What a great action, Tom. So this is what other people can do just as well. Write to your governor. 
ask the question, what emergency plan do they have in place if there is an accident at any of your local nuclear hotspots? Send as an email, and if you're so inclined, print out a copy and drop it in the snail mail. If you don't hear back in two to three weeks, repeat the process and then start calling. You need an answer. This will put the offices of these officials on alert that there are citizens watching their actions regarding nuclear reactors. It will also give you a heads up on the proposed evacuation plan and whatever glitches might be in it. For example, here in Southern California, the so-called evacuation plan for San Onofre was based on everyone merrily exiting in orderly fashion by way of a single highway along the coast, a highway that gets jammed to the gills every day in normal rush hour traffic. How much worse would it be in a nuclear emergency? That's the kind of thing you're looking for. Good luck taking this action, and when you get results, let me know. Send me an email at info at nuclearhotseat.com, and I'll be happy to share what you have discovered with the listening audience. Here's today's final thought. I think part of what hampers our attempts to build this movement is that the general public is not aware of what the dangers are that nuclear poses. Perception of radiation levels have been jiggered so much that so-called acceptable levels are increased, which does nothing to change the science or the damage created, just the context of perception. And as for the languaging, who deemed any level of radiation exposure acceptable in the first place? Ah, but languaging and context have been controlled by the nuke gang. The way to counter this is by creating better, more entertaining propaganda. We need to entertain as we educate and take full advantage of the Internet to get that information out. Here's an example. One of the thoughts I have mulled over to convey radiation information to the general public is to explain its dangers by using tap dancing. No, really, stick with me on this one. Gamma radiation, for example, is like an X-ray. It is a single straight shot. It can penetrate almost anything, and it might sound something like, <sighs> let's try that again, gamma radiation. <sighs> and gamma radiation, the straight shot, is given off by cesium-137. Beta emitters can penetrate the skin. They don't go as deeply as gamma, but there are a whole bunch more of them. One more time, beta particles. Beta particles are emitted by tritium, which is regularly, commonly, released from nuclear reactors into groundwater. Then there are alpha particles, such as are emitted by plutonium, uranium, radium, and radon. As you can tell, alpha emitters shoot electrons all over the place, but they can be stopped by paper, skin, or clothing. However, that does not mean alpha radiation is safe to be around. It only looks that way because the nuclear industry's evaluation of radiation danger is all based on external contamination. But radiation gets into our water, topsoil, plankton, plants, the animals and fish that eat those plants and plankton, and thus into us. That's where it becomes internal radiation, a whole different thing. So if we swallow, inhale, or absorb alpha particles, that seemingly safe, stoppable, alpha-emitting radionuclide becomes something that we have deep inside of us, up close and personal, with our internal organs. That's what's happening inside you when you ingest or inhale a single alpha particle. Got the idea? Good. Now, can you imagine a short, animated, radiation tap dance video? If you can, let me know. And let's see if we can make this happen. 
Feel free to take this idea and run with it yourself, or get in touch, and let's discuss it. You can send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Remember, when it comes to propaganda, whoever spins it, wins it. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 21, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from LATimes.com, SFGate.com, San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace, SEMSPub.EPA.gov, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Friends of the Earth, ChicagoBusiness.com, Reformer.com, WhiteWolfPack.com, NuclearResistor.org, WallStreetJournal.com, SierraClub.com, Reuters, Asahi.com, Fukushima-Diary.com, along with our friend Iori Mochizuki, Fukuleaks.org, TheJapanNews.org, DeUnRenard.WordPress.com, TheLocal.fr, Phys.org, P-H-Y-S.org, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, thanks to our good friend Erica Gray, and the activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat, who gather on our Facebook site, which you are all invited to visit and like. It's a great place to network with others if you're looking for information or contacts on nuclear issues in your area. Or a shoulder to cry on. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. If you know of an online news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com and let me know. And you can check out the archive of 260 shows, that's 260 shows, on the website NuclearHotSeat.com. You can also check the episodes on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos and on iTunes under Podcasts. Sign up on the website to receive notice and a link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode as an email in your very own inbox. As a bonus, you will also receive a chapter from my ebook. Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. It's the chapter where I'm on the ground at Three Mile Island as it is happening. Thrills, chills, spills, you'll love it. And the full book is available on Amazon. A reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please... Do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded in 112 countries. We activists are not alone, and we are linking. And because we've all had our wake-up call, nobody gets to go back to sleep. Because truly, we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.